So um, you should be able to see at the moment my opening slide, which has just got the title, Current Issues in Supply Chain Forecasting. And this is the first in our series of webinars for, uh, from the Centre for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. So because this is the first of the uh, webinars, I thought it would be a good idea just to introduce the Centre, just to let you know a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, you can see on this slide uh, pictures of the members of the Centre, and some of those members are actually present on the call today. Um, so they'll be able to perhaps participate at some point later during this event. Um, and as you can see on the left, some of the things that we do there in terms of short courses, consultancy and, and so on. And also some of our areas of expertise uh, are on the right. Um, I'm pleased to say our areas of expertise are quite broad because of the breadth of people that we have in this particular research centre. So we're able to cover quite a broad range of issues and we'll be doing that as well uh, in these uh, series of seminars. So uh, we'll look forward to those. So a little bit also that we don't work alone. Uh, we are a research centre. We are based in Lancaster University. So we're very much focused on trying to improve uh, forecasting methodologies and forecasting processes, but also we're interested in trying to enhance and improve where possible forecasting practice. And the only way we can do that is not just by working on our own in isolation, but working with others. So we work with some colleagues you'll see there on the left, uh, mainly from universities, but also including Dr. Stefan Kalasa from SAP. And we've, these, these colleagues are people who are also sharing interests with us in uh, being able to communicate knowledge and learn from uh, industrial partners. And on the right, you'll see some examples of uh, companies that we've worked with uh, over recent years. And we're very pleased to have done that and we're hoping uh, to do more of that in the future. OK, well, that's um, that's just by way of introduction. Maybe we can move on now to the main uh, body of this presentation and what was promised, and that is to uh, talk about supply chain forecasting. As you can see, there's four main areas that we're going to be focusing on today. Um, first of all, I want to give an overall framework for supply chain forecasting, which I think, well, I hope anyway, that people will find helpful and um, talk about some of the issues there, which are not just at the individual level, um, the, maybe an individual store or an individual product, but also which go beyond that. And you can see some of the aspects there that we'll be, uh, we'll be looking at. Uh, as you might expect from uh, Research Centre, we will be talking about statistical forecasting, both faster and slow moving products. Um, really important point, which is uh, often neglected actually, not, not, just, um, not just by software vendors, but also sometimes in forecasting courses as well, is this issue of performance measurement. How is, how is it that we should actually measure our performance here? What, what is good? What does good look like? And how do we know whether we're getting better or not? And finally, I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about what I think is a very topical issue. And, and that is structural break. And by a structural break, we just mean a major change that's happened um, in a time series. And of course, we've had a very major structural break earlier this year with the, uh, uh, with the pandemic that's, uh, that's arisen um, from February, March time, and of course is still with us now. Um, so I thought that would be a nice topical uh, issue to, uh, to finish this presentation with. Okay, right, well, having got the background out of the way and also uh, explained the, uh, the agenda, let's uh, proceed. So first thing, of course, before we can do any forecasting is we need to have some data. Now, I'm not going to give lots of quotations or citations in this particular presentation, but I am going to use one quotation, which is this one. And it's a nice old quotation from the 17th century uh, from Thomas Hobbes. Life is nasty, brutish and short. And uh, the reason I put that up is because data is like that, unfortunately, very often, much of the time. So we have to find ways of dealing with it. That's a reality that we face, and that's going to be a theme that will go through the presentation uh, this afternoon. So I'll just talk briefly about that then uh, in terms of data. 
One thing which is important, and we know that it's an issue with some companies that we've dealt with, is that the sales data and forecasts that they need um, are not always generated at the appropriate level of resolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, let's suppose that you are a retail store and you're ordering from your central warehouse and it only takes a couple of days for those products to arrive. Well, obviously, we're dealing with very short lead times there. So ideally, we should be looking at daily data and operating at the daily level and generating forecasts at the daily level and so on. If actually all your data is being collected at a weekly level, you can still do something. You can still disaggregate your data back to daily, but then that's being forced upon you. It's not a choice. It might be better to do it that way, but it, equally it might be better to actually work at the daily level. So that's one, one point which is really quite important and it's probably more a function of the software that's available to people. And something more and maybe under the control of the individual company is having accurate inventory records I'm not going to go into detail on this, but this is this is also crucial as well if you're going to have an effective inventory management system. So that includes things like having appropriate technology, RFID, for example, and being able to respond uh, to correct inaccuracies when they do do occur. And similarly, out of stock data is important, not just for monitoring performance, as it says, but also actually understanding where we're getting a divergence between sales and demand. We often talk about demand forecasting when in fact, of course, what's available to us is sales. If those two things are very close, then the approximation is reasonable. And if they're not so close, then the approximation is not reasonable and we might be uh, somewhat deluding ourselves as to what the true demand is. So let's ask some basic questions. These are basic questions which I believe any organization should ask itself when thinking about its forecasts. The most basic question of all is why are we forecasting? Or put another way, what would change if we changed our forecast? What would change as a result? What, what decisions would be different? Uh, these are just some examples I put up here in terms of warehousing, inventory, a very common application and transport planning. Now, once we've got those very basic questions out of the way, there's then another issue because this should inform fundamentally what to forecast. Now, in my experience, when I've spoken to organizations in the past, if I've asked that question, I've been of rather strange looks because yeah, surely it's obvious what we need to forecast. We need to forecast, let's say, sales, maybe in volume or in value terms, or maybe it's something else, but it's obvious. Well, it may be obvious, but what is maybe not quite so obvious is what is the appropriate level of aggregation? Are we fundamentally interested in stock keeping unit level or product group level or a higher level than that? What uh, granularity of location are we interested in? And similarly, what is the appropriate forecasting horizon? I'll touch on this later, but our measurement of forecasting performance should link to the horizon which is truly relevant for, uh, for what we're trying to achieve. And also, of course, when we're asking what to forecast, what about the stage of the supply chain? Uh, are we at the uh, retail level? Are we at the wholesale level or at the manufacturer level? And can we be using data from other levels to help us to forecast more accurately? So those are some of the questions which may look to be a little bit like idiot questions, but of course, like all basic questions, when you think about them hard enough, you can actually uh, sometimes deepen your appreciation of some of the nuances of what uh, what's currently being done and how it could be improved. So here's a diagram and this diagram is trying to encapsulate some of the major dimensions of supply chain forecasting. We have on the bottom the classic supply chain where consumer on the right and then we go through the retailer, wholesaler and manufacturer and then at the top we've got um, other dimensions so the product and location dimensions are there. And now, of course, we can uh, we could have added there if we wanted to, uh, not just the offline locations, but perhaps an online location uh, as well. And then separately, and we'll, we'll treat this a little bit uh, differently, is the temporal or time dimension as well, which can also help us in our task. OK, so we're going to use that, this diagram on a, a few occasions just to structure the presentation and to orient ourselves a little bit. So we'll talk briefly about the bullwhip effect. Um, this is a very well known 
uh, effect, and this is where we have relatively stable demand at the end consumer, which is on the left, and then as we proceed through the supply chain, it becomes more variable. Uh, perhaps this is, diagram is somewhat exaggerated, just to make the point, but it is a genuine phenomenon. And the first example of this, you may be aware of this, was with Procter & Gamble with their Pampers product. Um, so babies nappies or diapers, if you're American. Um, well, obviously babies have re regular habits, so you don't expect to see great variability in demand. So what we're seeing here is variability being induced actually by uh, things that we are doing, uh, we as uh, supply chain people are doing. And a number of causes have been identified for this. Um, and there, there they are, these are the main ones. Price fluctuation is an obvious one perhaps. Um, also batch ordering, as batches get bigger, we tend to see more variability. Shortage gaming has very much come to the fore recently, of course. Uh, whenever we have um, major shortages, people start to buy more than they really need because they're worried about stock running out, and that's a well-known phenomenon. And finally, demand signal processing, which I won't go into too much detail, is, is to do with the way our ordering um, rules work and how they, combined with the forecasts, can actually induce greater variability as we move up the chain. The reason I want to pause on this is I don't want to spend too long on the Bullwhip effect, but I wanted to make a very basic point, which is that if it's possible for us to reduce the variability of demand itself or the demand that we are trying to forecast, then that in itself will be beneficial because it's always going to be easier to achieve good accuracy if we have less variable data uh, to begin with. So this is one strategy that we can take to improve forecasting in the supply chain without even getting into uh, improving the forecasting methods themselves. So in terms of countering the bullwhip then, so at source, well, we could simply go with the strategy of having more regular pricing and perhaps less promotions. That's not always realistic, of course, but if we could identify promotions that perhaps just have the effect of people bringing their purchasing forward, to take advantage of the promotion, but then actually not buying any more in total over a period of time, then that's not beneficial from a sales perspective. And it's definitely, definitely not beneficial from an inventory perspective either. Smaller batch sizes are the natural thing to do. Rationing policies. Well, here's something which is very much in the news at the moment. We can devise rationing policies and that they're not necessarily for consumers at uh, retail outlets. They could be rationing policies uh, that wholesalers impose on retailers, for example, to try and smooth the demand somewhat. And finally, there's uh, also possibilities of actually modifying the inventory policies themselves. Another strategy that's been um, widely discussed and implemented in part, I would say, in practice is just sharing information, that if we can share some information, even if we can't reduce the variability itself, which is what the top part of that slide is about. So we suppose we can't do that. Is it still possible to improve our forecasting by sharing information? So here's some examples. Uh, it will clearly be beneficial the greater advance warning we have of any price changes and discounts because we can take account of that. Also, if there are going to be large batch orders coming in, if we know of those well in advance, that can help us as well to plan and we, we don't need to forecast that separately because it's a known, it's known in advance that this is going to come. Um, also, we could share inventory data. And finally, and this is the one that's probably being researched the most in the academic literature, we can actually share demand data as well. And that would mean that, for example, a wholesaler would have direct access to retailer demand data and therefore could use that data directly rather than having to rely on the orders that will come through. So these, these are some possibilities. As to whether they're appropriate for any particular organisation, obviously very much depend upon your own context. Some of those things may not be realistic in, in some organisations, but may be um, quite advantageous in, in others. Okay, so let's come back to this framework again. And we've looked at that bottom part, which is about the movement of demand through the chain. We can now maybe think about what's sometimes called cross-sectional issues. So things like products and locations might be, might be relevant. One thing we can take advantage of in, in supply chain forecasting is that we very, have, very often have quite natural what are called cross-sectional hierarchies. Um, so there's, there it is in abstract, let's be a bit more concrete. 
they could be product groupings, for example. So the bottom level could be stock keeping units, the level above that may be some product uh, codes perhaps, and above that may be product categories, that sort of thing. Or geographical locations also possible, maybe offline, online, that sort of thing. This can be advantageous in many ways. One way which is often overlooked actually, which I'll just mention briefly, is that um, estimating seasonal patterns is not always easy because we very often have relatively short data. And so if we're trying to do this at the lowest level, and that can be quite difficult to do accurately. If we have a whole group of products which we believe to share a common seasonal profile, then it may make sense to go up at least one level in this hierarchy and to work out the seasonal effect there. Now to do that, it's even better if those seasonal factors um, are multiplicative, so factors like 1.3, meaning 30% higher than usual, because if we can work that out at that higher level, we can immediately use it at the lower level as well, obviously with this assumption that we've got some um, homogeneous seasonal patterns here. But if we have, that could be quite a, quite a good strategy to use to try to improve our forecasts when we've got limited history and that's particularly true if we're looking at week of year seasonality uh, for example and we've only got a couple of years of data less relevant perhaps for things like day of week seasonality where we can uh, get the uh, the data uh, much more easily so that's the cross-sectional hierarchy how can we go about it well there's classic ones are called top down and bottom up um, and we'll talk a little bit more about them but basically top down is what it says you you forecast at the high level and then if necessary disaggregate Whereas bottom up starts at the lowest level and then one aggregates it. And another approach which has been um, advocated in recent years and is now becoming quite well developed is called reconciliation. And here, instead of doing top down and bottom up, we actually forecast at all levels of the hierarchy. So just to explain the top down and bottom up in a little bit more detail. So on the left, we have um, uh, the top down approach. Well, what we start with is the uh, aggregate level that's on the top left. And what we do with that is we do a, a direct forecast at that aggregate level. But of course, if we need to get down to the sub aggregate level, whatever that may be, then there needs to be some mechanism to allow us to do that. So this this can be a good approach, but it's not necessarily going to be more accurate. Typically, we would expect at the aggregate level to have more accurate forecasts, of course, because the data is more regular. However, we will lose accuracy when we go down back to the sub-aggregate level. Now, whether that's better than, the plot, than going direct, we can, we can determine by actually checking it empirically. And the bottom-up works the opposite way. We start at the lowest level, we generate forecasts at that lowest level, and then we aggregate and we get the forecast that we need at the, at the higher level. So these are the so classic approaches which have been uh, suggested and there is a slight variation if we have three levels instead of top down or bottom up we could have middle out we start at the middle and then we go up and we go down so that's also possible as well. The other approach um, which is one that uh, certain um, researchers have advanced quite a lot actually is to do something a bit different and that is to independently forecast all the series. So we, we forecast at all levels of the hierarchy actually. And then having done that, we then look to reconciliation. We're looking to make sure basically that the forecasts add up. They're at the lowest level, if we add those forecasts up, they add up to the next level. Now to, to do that reconciliation is, is somewhat more involved, but it is possible to do that. And it also means that patterns that we might not be seeing at the lowest level, but we do see at the higher level can still be reflected in the in the lower level forecasts. So that's that, that's um, an alternative. There are some caveats with it. One is the issue of scalability. This has been applied very nicely, by the way, in, in things like tourism forecasting. Um, in tourism forecasting, we're looking at um, perhaps a whole country, but we're also looking at regions within it. And that's the, the method seems to have worked very well there. As far as I'm aware, at least, um, I don't think this is this is yet available in commercial packages, but it is certainly available as open source software. Uh, in R, so uh, there is that opportunity to use it. So coming back to this framework again, we've looked at the um, at the supply chain at the bottom. We've looked at those two cross-sectional aspects of product 
and location. Uh, we haven't yet looked at the time dimension uh, which is going along the bottom there, so let's think about that. Well, you'll notice this is the same diagram as the one we had previously. It's again showing a hierarchy, but this time this is not a hierarchy of things or products. Uh, it's, a, it's a hierarchy of time. So to give you an example, it's a somewhat strange example, but it'll hopefully make the point of what it, what it is. The total might be a year. A and B could be half years, let's say. So obviously two half years giving you a full year. Um, a is a half year, so each of those three blocks underneath it could be blocks of two months, let's say. Um, B is also a half year, so that could be blocks of three months. That's perhaps somewhat unnatural to, to break it up like that. It would be more natural for B perhaps to go also into groups of two months. But we can do that however we wish. So we could have, or we could have weeks split into days, for example, or we could have um, quarters split into, into weeks. Um, I'll briefly mention that there are complications that can arise with this, but we won't go into them now. Um, I'm sure some of my colleagues may wish to comment if, if people are interested in this aspect of it. And that is uh, obviously the number of weeks does not exactly go into a full year and then um, we get these issues also particularly with months as well. So there are some um, uh, technicalities that would need to be resolved. But nonetheless, the basic idea I think uh, is, is a sound one and it, it gives us some opportunities. So here's, here's a very basic opportunity which is actually not used very often in practice, but it's a really practical thing that can be done for supply chain forecasting. Let us suppose just for the moment that um, what we've got is we've got 16 weeks of data, which you see there on the bottom. Let's suppose as well um, that our lead time is of, um, uh, let's say four weeks. So if we aggregate each of those into four weekly blocks, then what we then have is a temporal aggregation. We've aggregated the data up. It's non overlapping, so it's not overlapping one over the other. You can see at the bottom they're entirely distinct. And what we could now do is we could, instead of trying to forecast the bottom series, we could try to forecast the top series and do it directly. So why might we do that? What are the possible advantages of doing that? Essentially, it is that um, it's quite possible that a clearer trend and seasonal pattern can emerge up as lower, lower frequencies. So in this case, four week blocks rather than one week block. The other point is, and this is really relevant to many supply chain companies, is uh, intermittence is always a, a difficult problem. And sometimes we can find that at least some of our intermittent data can become non-intermittent by this process of aggregation. So that's helpful as well. There are some disadvantages which we need to take into account count. Uh, one is that if your data is, is changing very rapidly, then it may be better, in fact, to actually update, let's say, every week and to, to do it that way and to base your data on the very latest week rather than on blocks of four weeks. That's possible. And also there is a practical issue as well that if we have different lead times for different products, then those need to be taken into account uh, when we implement this in any system. But nonetheless, it gives us another opportunity to improve our forecasting. A further development of this is, let's suppose we did want data, uh, forecast of data at a weekly level, but we could start by uh, blocking up. Well, let's, let's take the example on the slide. So we start with monthly and we aggregate up to get quarterly data. You see that with the bold blue arrow there. We then use a method, as it happens, this is just the naive method, but that's just the illustration. The naive method is just taking the last observation to be our forecast. Not the best way of forecasting, but for, for the purpose of illustration, it's, it's OK. What we have to do at the end, and you see the question marks on the bottom right, is we need to find a way of getting that aggregate forecast, in this case over the quarter, back down to monthly. And this is where we can lose accuracy. So one way we could do it would be with equal weights, but if we think there's a seasonality within the period, then we need maybe to adjust for that. So this is where we could potentially lose, um, lose some accuracy. It's worth mentioning too, because I, I talked about reconciliation, that um, reconciliation methods are not just relevant for cross-sectional, they can also be done uh, for temporal as well. So we can, again, we could have multiple forecasts at different levels and then reconcile them. Right, okay. I'm going to pause there then. So that's 
I think that's enough in terms of the overall framework. I'm going to talk briefly about statistical methods. I'm not going to do a Cook's tour of all of the um, statistical methods which are available. I just want to make some high level points and uh, maybe that will that will be more helpful. So we'll start with um, medium or fast series um, or in, in the case of an ABC classification, I suppose these will be the A or B products. We usually make assumptions of the data being normally distributed, which is usually reasonable in this case. And the methods which are standard, but actually they can work well if they're executed well, would be various forms of exponential smoothing, including trend and seasonality factors for non-causal. And then for causal, where we may have data such as promotions or discounts, those sort of things, uh, then regression-based forecasts can be used. Now, in many supply chains, um, there are actually as many or more um, series and products in the second category of slow or intermittent. Here, the normal assumption doesn't work very well. And one of the things to check here is what your system is doing. Is it, it what is it assuming? Is it assuming perhaps the data is Poisson instead? That's not necessarily unreasonable, except that if your demand is also erratic, then it doesn't model it so well. Negative binomial is, a, is an alternative. Or we can look to causal methods here, though it depends upon having data available. Maintenance would be a good example, where we know how long something uh, has been with, uh, without a service. And for these slow and intermittent series, we shouldn't be using the usual exponential smoothing methods. We need some variants. I'll just briefly explain why. So this is um, exponential, single exponential smoothing. You can see in blue the occasions when there's been demand. In purple, we have the overall average of those demands. In yellow, they are yellow points. The yellow points are highlighting just after a demand has occurred. And of course, that's the point at which we'll need to make an order. So from an inventory perspective, it's the yellow ones that are the most important. Now, what this diagram tells you is that if you were to look at the average of the red dots, which is the sort of all points, actually including the, the yellow as well, which has a little red inside it, the average would work out well and it would pretty much approximate to that purple dotted line. However, if you just look at the yellow points, you will see that they are actually too high. And that's the problem that we get with single exponential smoothing. So Croston's method, one would hope, would be available within uh, software that's uh, accessible to you. Um, it still has a, a problem of its own. Um, and boiler approximation is another alternative, which has been implemented in some software packages to date. And also just say, and this is a broader issue, that it's important to classify your products well. So here we're just looking at that distinction between whether we go for intermittent or non-intermittent. And here the suggestion would be to look at two things, the speed of movement, which is the horizontal axis, and the variability, uh, which is on the, on the vertical axis. Um, and just to explain the notation, the mu subscript i, that means the average interval between demands. So a low interval of demand means faster demand, a high interval means slower demand. And on the vertical axis, that's the variability of demand size, how variable demand is when it occurs, going uh, from low to high as we go upwards. So there, there are many ways of doing this, but some approach to categorization is always useful. I want to say a little bit about performance measurement because this is another issue which we often come across and it's uh, hotly debated. So before we get into the into the debates, let's talk about some of the basic requirements. One thing is that we need to be measuring our performance at the appropriate level of aggregation. So if we're fundamentally interested in forecasts at let's say a product code level, then we should be monitoring accuracy at product code level and similarly at SKU level if that's what we need. Also, the horizon. We've come across situations where organizations are, for example, monitoring forecast accuracy over four or six weeks ahead. Uh, OK, fine. But actually, what they really need is the forecast for one week ahead. So let's try and make that consistent with our business requirements rather than it being a more artificial measure. And of course, we can do it for separate categories uh, as we've just been looking at. There's two ways of looking at it as well, and that is is it just forecast accuracy we're interested in? Well, clearly we are, but also we're also interested in the implications of those forecasts. What does that mean for us? Whether that's in terms of transport or warehousing or inventory. 
and this is illustrating this a little bit more with inventory. We have on the left a diagram showing um, what we've forecast, not just a point forecast, but the whole distribution of forecast. This is a slower moving item, so you can see on the left that there's high probabilities of demand and that goes lower. But then that interfaces with the stock management system where we need to set certain targets. And what's coming out at the right hand side, these are not forecast accuracy measures. These are measures of how well the system is performing given the performance of the forecast that we have. And that's in this case in terms of stockholding costs, but also service level performance, the availability of product. And we can look at that in a standard sort of way. We can look at it in terms of a trade off curve. So on the on the horizontal here, we have the amount of stock and that's going up as you go to the right. And then on the on the vertical axis, we have the unfilled rate of demand. So obviously we want that unfilled rate generally to be lower. So if we take a particular level of unfilled, which may be 5%, if you go along that, you can see that the blue method, method one, is doing better than the red and the green because they require higher stocks to achieve the same service. So this is quite a nice visual tool to use with managers. Also, there's an issue which is worth stressing, which is that accuracy needs to be looked at in both signed and unsigned way. So unsigned errors, what one may be more used to, would be things like mean absolute percentage error. And we ignore the direction of error there. But we can also look at signed errors as well. These are measuring bias. They're measuring whether forecasts are consistently too high or consistently too low. And it's detecting, as it says on the slide there, the direction of error. And my recommendation really is to use both. Um, the reason for that is that inventory benefits, um, you can get inventory benefits even if you don't do much in terms of the unsigned errors, but you do manage, let's say, to cut down the bias, you'll still get a benefit. And also, look at it another way, if you do find a bias problem, then that can help you to uh, resolve it and to come up with a better method. Um, I'm indebted here to one of my colleagues, uh, Robert Files, who worked with one of his colleagues at the time on these criteria for what makes a good accuracy measure. These are really sensible recommendations. First of all, they need to be interpretable to people understand them. They've got some idea what they actually mean, because if they do, they can act upon them. Do they cope with outliers? Well, atypical observations, because we don't want these measures to be too sensitive to that. And finally, scale and dependence. If we're looking across many different products, uh, across uh, wide volumes from low to high volume, we don't want the measure to be too affected by the scale of the data. Otherwise, the results will be dominated by a small number of series. So here's some examples of things that could be used. Uh, we could have, um, we could make them scale independent by dividing by the mean demand, or we could look at it compared to a benchmark method. So if you're looking to improve, for example, your natural benchmark would be your current method. And then you look at the new method in comparison to it. And these are the sort of measures um, one, might, uh, one might look at. And finally, percentage best, which would be saying, well, do a little competition and what proportion of series are best forecast by one method or by another. I want to just say a little bit about structural breaks. We all know that we've been in a period of a massive structural break. So this is showing GDP and it's showing it for across the whole world and for various types of economies. And it's year on year GDP growth. And if we look back over 20 years, you can see the, uh, cri the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And, but you can also now see, of course, the pandemic. What can we say about future breaks? Well, my only prediction is we'll have some. I couldn't tell you when, I don't think anybody can, but it's reasonable to presume that further breaks will happen at some point. So we need to be prepared for them. We need to have at least some thoughts as to how we might deal with them. It's in this situation that judgmental forecasts do come to the fore because the methods we've talked about so far there in statistical forecasts, they can be quite slow. And also the error measures can be quite slow as well, even picking up that there's been a problem in terms of the uh, inaccuracy. And that leads us on to certain questions then. If judgmental forecasts are natural in this situation, can they be better informed? Could there be more information which would help people make better judgmental forecasts? And also, as we move out of a, um, in this case it's a pandemic, but out of any structural break, can we actually find ways to then start gradually taking more account of those statistical forecasts as we reach some sort of stability? 
Now, the reason I'm putting this up and highlighting it is that this is a this is something that's interesting us very much at the moment, and we're just embarking on a research project. But we don't want this to be a theoretical, purely theoretical project. We want it to actually relate to people's real experience. So if you are interested in this, um, please drop us a line after the meeting and we'd be very interested to, uh, to discuss it with you more. Well, um, I was asked to give half an hour. I think I've just about just gone over half an hour. So this is just a quick advertisement for our next two webinars. One from Oliver Sher, it's in two weeks time on forecasting software and one from Mike Thomas two weeks after that, um, uh, which is more oriented towards machine learning. So we hope um, you will be able to join us for those. So thanks very much. And that concludes my presentation. John, John thank, thank you. you for that. that. Uh, uh, very interesting, very interesting wide, wide ranging, ranging. Um, and an introduction to a number of our talks which are focused on software. We've got one or two questions and let me mm -hmm encourage people to uh, send some questions in. Uh, um, uh, Mike Gilliland of SAS has uh, said that his, the SAS forecasting server software has hierarchical reconciliation both um, cross-sectional and in time and Very we'll good. be okay. looking at some of the features of various software packages after the uh, survey that uh, was carried out for informs uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago. But okay. anyway, what about questions of John? I will read them to you, John, okay. uh, uh, if and when they come in. Okay. Um, perhaps uh, in, the, in the meantime, um, well, no, we've got a question for Nicholas Vanderput about uh, the search for a unified forecast which obviously li list, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, relates to disaggregation, aggregation issues. Yeah. OK, so if, if, it's, if the question is in terms of the desirability of unified forecasts, well, clearly it is um, a desirable thing. So we've seen a statistical approach. Um, and thanks, Mike, for your comment. I was glad that when I did get to that, I did put a little caveat in. I think I said, as far as I'm aware. So uh, <laughs> so th thanks for uh, for letting us know that you've, you've got that facility. So there is a st there is a statistical answer to that. Um, but I think there's also um, an issue of, of forecast process as well because very often we're not just looking at the statistical forecast, we're also looking at some process of, uh, of adjustment. And so the really, I think this can become much more a question of how one designs forecasting processes and how the statistical forecast and the, and the judgmental process interact. This is what I was sort of touching on there right at the end. Um, having a purely statistical approach can work well, but equally when we have these major disruptions, it doesn't. Having a purely judgmental approach, and this is something Robert has researched quite deeply, um, can have all sorts of problems in terms of optimism, biases, and things of this nature. So we clearly need a way for these two things to interrelate. And this is what I'm trying to, to promote here, that if there's a way of the statistical forecast at appropriate levels of aggregation, informing things like SNOP meetings, for example, then we may have a better chance of getting at least to some agreement, even if we don't get that magic one number forecast that everybody would like. This actually uh, links to another question mm -hmm. from uh, Anthony Hines, which are about structural breaks and the lack of predictability. So how can, mm -hmm. with that lack of predictability, supply chains be uh, linked to the decisions in supply chain be linked to forecasts? I mean, I know that's a pretty mm -hmm. tough question, but uh, your thoughts anyway. So, OK, so we're talking about different levels of uncertainty, aren't we? So my, I suppose my, my thought would be no matter how uncertain something is, we still have to make a decision and we still have to decide to do something. <coughs> don't we? And maybe one of the things that's changed in recent years has been a change of emphasis from simply thinking about point forecasts. In other words, we think the sales will be this number. Instead of thinking of that, to think about a whole distribution. So we think, well, yes, it might be that number. That may be the most likely, but we're looking at a whole range. We're looking at it being between a certain range of numbers, or even as I showed on one of those slides, a nice little diagram showing probabilities as well. 
that I think gives people a more realistic assessment of, of what's ahead of them. And it also, I think, throws a challenge out, which is that if we're in a situation where we can't necessarily improve our accuracy, our point accuracy better, we can't do it any better or much better, can we at least try and get a better understanding of what the full distribution is? Because if we can do that, then at least we can still make better uh, or more better informed anyway, um, supply chain decisions. So I hope that helps a little bit anyway. Robert, any any other points? There's no other questions come in. So um, let me ask mm -hmm. what may be the, the final question. Okay. Uh, we, in some companies, uh, you get a lot of um, expertise and a lot of emphasis on forecasting. Uh, attempts to adopt machine learning, for example, mm. as a, a, a partial solution to the issues of uh, supply chain forecasting. In mm. others, perhaps the majority, in fact, I would say certainly the majority, and I, I'd be interested in Mike's uh, experience here. The, uh, there's little innovation, really. There's People are, are still satisfied with poor forecasting, uh, despite all the evidence that it hits the bottom line. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? What are the barriers in the companies that you've experienced? OK, well, I think there's well, there's many barriers, aren't there? I mean, one is just the basic um, purchase decision of what software you go with, because whatever software you go with, um, it, it may meet other requirements of the organization in terms of integrating data, for example, across different um, different parts of the organization, but it may not uh, address all your forecasting needs. So that one obvious takeaway is to say to place better or more emphasis on the on the forecasting side of things. The other thing, of course, and I would say this as, as an educator, perhaps, but I really think it's important in order, even if you do get a reasonably sophisticated system, how much of it is actually used is, would be a question I would ask. So you have all these facilities available to you. How many, how many of them are used? Now, one of the reasons sometimes these facilities are not used is, well, it could be that they're not appropriate in the first place, but it could be that they are and that actually there's been very limited training going on. So some form of training that goes beyond which buttons to press and actually understands a little bit more about what the options are available to people, I really think will be money well spent. Now, I appreciate that at the moment, and particularly in this pandemic, development budgets are possibly going to be one of the first things to get cut. I, I totally understand that. But at the same time, when perhaps the purse strings get um, relaxed a little bit, I would strongly urge people to think about doing this because it means two things. One is they can make better use of the forecasting software they've got. And that would be great in itself. And also the, the whole thing about how you present forecasts is important. I mean, I only touched on it, but it's really important to get the buy in of our senior colleagues. And secondly, people will be better informed when it comes to the next round of purchasing new uh, forecasting software. I think that would be my main main thoughts, Robert. Thank you, John. I think we should call it uh, a day there. And uh, again, a, a short uh, advertisement for the, uh, the the next presentation in a couple of weeks. We'll hope we'll have overcome some of the glitches or mostly yeah. fortunately minor. I could at least see both John and the presentation and hear things, which I suppose is really the, the core of it. But uh, anyway, we look forward to uh, meeting up again. Uh, and we'll be posting, will we, Ivan, uh, the uh, slides on the, uh, well, a link to the slides uh, to all uh, attendees. Thank you again, John. Thanks, Robert. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone.